live now good evening everybody and welcome to the 35th edition of ima's popular leader speak program this is a particularly special program for all of us at ima because we have a very favorite past president preeta reddy who is here along with shobhna kamenani and puansh who is representing the next generation so it's really the top notch team of apollo who is here and we have the president of ima mr harshpati singhania who is going to moderate this very very interesting session today's session is particularly special given the uh, excitement around the covid vaccine we are all excited and hopeful of getting our lives back and we can't wait to hear by when but with the excitement of the vaccine also comes the fear of taking it will it work will there be dangerous side effects has it been tested thoroughly and many many other such questions never in the history of man has a vaccine been made so fast a vaccine which generally takes 5 to 6 years if not more is out in less than a year how is that possible such questions and many more grip all of us but the fact that the covid vaccine is finally here and the world is racing to get immunity from a virus that has killed 1.6 million people during the past year and left more than 70 million people sick this virus has destroyed lives and livelihoods and dragged the world economy into a recession never has a vaccine been developed in such a short time as i said and never have there been so many different approaches to making a vaccine perhaps it's a good thing that four to five different kinds of vaccines have become available at the same time as the multiple consortiums succeeding simultaneously the world will have substantial volume of covid vaccine however having an acceptable vaccine is one thing and delivering it to 7.8 billion people around the world is quite another with 1.3 to 1.4 billion of them in india with limited early production and complicated logistics the vaccine will not be available to all immediately a bigger irony is that though the vaccines are now, are now available not everybody would be willing to be injected with the vaccines that have been developed and approved so fast the next few months would be crucial for achieving herd immunity which is critical if the corona virus has to be has had to be has to be contained today we are privileged to have the top leadership team of apollo group of hospitals with us and we have a unique opportunity to find out when how and to whom the vaccines will be available and possibly at what price while there is a lot of excitement about the vaccine there is also a lot of confusion because facts and speculations have got mixed up preeta preeta shobhna puansh it's a pleasure to have you and many many thanks to each one of you for agreeing to talk to us about the distribution and delivery of covid vaccines in india it is now my pleasure to invite mr harshpati singhania president ima to welcome the distinguished guests and take over the session thank you uh thanks rekha uh, for that uh... for that uh, setting the context in a very clear manner um uh, really i i don't have to welcome uh, aima uh people formally back into an aima session so preeta uh, who has been past president aima welcome uh she's also the vice chairperson at apollo hospitals uh, shobhna kamineni uh who is uh, also the executive vice chairperson at apollo welcome to you and to um, a very special person today puansh kamenini uh, who is the executive director at kaimet uh, private limited uh, and really welcome to you as well and uh, it's great to have top management um, team uh, uh, from uh, india's perhaps a most well known uh, private sector uh, healthcare provider apollo uh, hospitals uh, a group and really it's it's a delight to have all of you here on this on on this call um ladies and gentlemen i see uh, a very large number of people have logged in including several of our uh, past presidents and uh, so that that itself speaks about the curiosity that all of us have about uh, what's really going to happen uh, in this in this world um you know i think uh, rekha has said it so i don't have to sort of repeat what has been said 
But the issues, while, while we have spent the last several months trying to understand a little bit about COVID, and essentially, because there's no past history, and there are no medical um, details and records to that extent, we just like learning to uh, fly or, or, or rebuild the airplane while it is flying. And uh, so everybody is learning. And I, I think the good sign is that the, uh, the medical community has very, very quickly uh, learned several nuances. For example, the treatment that is happening for people who have, are inflicted with COVID today is somewhat, or the protocol at least that is being followed is somewhat different from what was being done to people who, who contracted COVID say four months ago or five months ago, because there is so much of new learning that is happening. So while we are now familiar with COVID, uh, I think the next phase, and if I may say the next level of, uh, in a way, excitement is around the fact that globally, uh, every day we are hearing uh, announcements or uh, results from uh, a possible vaccine. And uh, there are several that are being developed. Uh, and it is really very heartening that out of sort of 33 vaccines that are being considered globally at a clinical phase trial, 10 of which have been are in advanced stage. And there are three Indian vaccines as part of the so that really, from an Indian standpoint, is really a matter of great pride. Uh, so now the questions really revolve more around when, uh, and as, as Rekha said in her opening remarks, uh, the, the development of the vaccine in such a short time, which has never happened before, how safe are they? And then the whole issue around you know, uh, the protocol of who, what will be the protocol of, uh, of inoculation of various people who are going to be inoculated first, how do we do this? And the entire huge task of actually administering this, you know, sub-zero temperatures or low temperature transportation, do we have enough glass vials? Do we have enough production capacity? How are we going to distribute it? So from what I read and what I heard actually at um, uh, Dr. Uh, v. the IO saying that we're going to use it and do it like we would do in election. Uh, so the whole how India rolls out elections is how they plan to they're thinking around this. So who could be better? But uh, the three of you from the from the healthcare space who are intimately involved with uh, this whole uh, developing process and the evolution of of what's going on to um, to sort of illuminate us with uh, what really. Uh, can happen, how we you think this will go about. And also, of course, in a developing country like India, the cost of a vaccine. So, for example, the Pfizer vaccine is supposed to be far more expensive, while these will be, uh, with this will be different. Some of the ones that are being developed by other people, including AstraZeneca, etc., which would be manufactured by the Serum Institute. So, really, uh, with that, I would hand over uh, to you, Preetha, first. Uh, uh, to kick off the proceedings, and then we will have perhaps uh, Shobhana making some comments, and then I think Juan she wants to share um, a presentation, which would be very, uh, very educative for all of us. So, uh, Preeta, over to you, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think between you and Rekha, you've actually covered uh, quite a bit. Uh, the, from March till now, I think we've had uh, one chaotic year. You know, it's uh, we, we really never knew if we were coming or going. And when COVID started, uh, we were frightened with the outcomes. We were frightened with the mortalities. And now uh, with just fantastic clinical protocols and pathways, the, the mortality percentage has come down. So in a way, it, uh, you know, we've kind of succeeded in that space. And the whole SMS plan, which was the social distancing, masking, sanitization, it has brought the numbers down. So I think there we seem, as humanity, we seem to have a handle on it. But having said that, uh, the biggest daunting task, not only in India, but globally, has been on the, vac on the vaccination. And multiple questions, you know, on every forum, there are a lot of questions about when, which, who, how, 
uh, how are we going to handle these? The Niti Aayog with Dr. V. K. Paul Shubhna just told me about that. You know, a 148-page document which just came out, and I think between her and Puanch, they've read uh, most of it. So I think that that is really a learning in itself. But I'm just um, amazed at the at the magnitude of work which needs to be done, and it is the world's largest simultaneous global public health initiative ever to ever ever undertaken and you know that's the magnitude of what what we're going to set ourselves out to out to do and what has to be done i it's not really something a single institution or a single government or anyone can do it's the government healthcare professionals large community groups everyone coming together to deliver it and uh, i think while the science of it the scientists have done an amazing work, job you know they've compressed what typically would have taken maybe even 5 to 10 years to do and they've managed to do it in 5 months so i think uh, the scientific community has been phenomenal but now the baton actually has to pass into the executors and we can't hear you Krita, you've gone on mute. Okay, that that was a bit of an accident. Is that is that okay now? So I was just saying that the challenge is going to be so unprecedented, and uh, you know how are we going to handle it? Is really everyone coming together to do it? Uh, Shobna and Puanch have have literally been working twenty four seven. You know, Shobna's uh, company, which she launched, is also twenty four seven. but uh, she and puanch have been working 24/7 to see how do we really meet that last mile commitment and you know how do we you know set out to vaccinate uh, her number what she gave was like a million people so how do we get to that target because i think uh, that that's really what india is going to need to do and work together with the governments uh, provided ethically so these are all the challenges which we are going to be faced with and i'm going to um quickly pass it on to shobhna and puanch to really walk us through what the initiative is all about because uh, because it is very exciting and it is quite daunting you know uh, but i think we should be able to do it when we're all working together shobhna you all know uh, you know she uh, more than anything else she's my sister and the executive vice chair of the apollo hospitals group and she's been an entrepreneur from childhood so she's the one who keeps the rest of us on our toes and keeps us running and so so that that is shobhna and puanch i think you know apples don't fall too far away from the tree but uh, he's somebody in his own right and has been working uh, tremendously on from the time covid started so i so we like to hear from both of them what the next steps where is when which who how i think these were the four questions everybody had so let's uh, let me hand over to shobhna and shobhna you will hand it over to punch and then uh, puanch and then we'll have our question and answers great uh, thank you good evening to everybody uh, uh, and uh, lovely seeing you reka after a long time and uh, harsh my friend and uh, so many others out there in aima and uh, pita and all the past presidents i'm jumping in directly um what made us uh, think that you know there's light at the end of the tunnel was when the first when astrazeneca announced that uh, that that the oxford was going to work and uh, and uh, the serum institute said that they were going to have a billion uh, units and early about 4 5 months ago i spoke to uh, i spoke to adar punawala and i said is the, is it possible for the private sector to buy and and he said take a chance <laughs> so what we did is we took a chance and and made sure that uh, we got together a small project team and said what would it take and then uh, as puanch will present he he said it's not about getting the vaccine but making sure that it was administered correctly that through the supply chain and i think that's what he'll focus on and that took us almost 4 months and a lot of time we we were again like um, 
much like the vaccine was till now in the dark and, and you're building a plane while it's flying, this was also the case that all of us were building capabilities ahead of the curve and saying, what is it we should do? How is it going to be administered? Anyway, the good news is that, that on Friday, uh, the government actually finished the, the high power, the committee actually finished their deliberations and came up and came up with an entire document that, uh, that, that actually talks about how this is going to happen. Phase one, very clearly. In the first, uh, phase one will encompass healthcare workers. They will be the first people to get it. Uh, this, and the frontline workers. Frontline workers meaning the police who are in the front lines maintaining the sanitation workers, those who are helping the healthcare workers, all these will be the next level of people. Uh, along with the health, the frontline workers will also be the most vulnerable population. And this is very interesting, the conversation I had about why India defined 50 with comorbidities and above is a very interesting mathematical dialogue that they said that many countries first had said, let us do, uh, let us make it above 65 or let's make it above 70. But, but what in the mathematical calculation, if we did that, the death rate would still be, and if, if it was at 65, our death rate would still be around 55%. So, and then what happened at 60, at 60, if we did it 60 with comorbidities, and then finally, they, they recognized that if they could do 50 with comorbidities and, and above 65 uh, years old, if the population gets it first, we will bring down India's death rate by 80%, which means that it becomes almost a negligible statistic in India because, again, the protocols of treatment are so advanced that, that actually the, the death rate itself has dropped. And within that, once you have... Uh, the government has procured, they have, uh, they have supplies, they have uh, supplies from two, there, there are only two candidates and Puanch will explain it in more detail about why and what, but, but you will see in India that it is only the AstraZeneca Oxford and the Bharat Biotech. Um, uh, we've had personal conversations with the others, with many of the others, and I can, uh, I can quite confidently tell you that the next that the next wave of candidates will be out only uh, earliest April, possibly June, that the next uh, vaccines will come out. And then, th and in that, there's a whole host of, of new vaccines because India has great ca capability, whether it's SIDUS, whether it's biologically with, uh, with uh, j and a single dose and, and, and many others, the RNA, MNA vaccine, the Genova, which is developed in India, all these will come out and, and Puanch, please talk a little bit about it. But what I want to tell you is the first, is that first wave of these people. The government has put in place, they've, they've entrusted the entire distribution to the public sector companies. They've, they've said, use your CSR money, let's build the capability. My question is, my question to them is, what happens later? That's kind of gonna go waste. But they said, no. This and, and the whole reason that they did this was because of the biggest problem is public unrest. So I think our responsibility as citizens is to recognize that the government understands what it's done. And those 300 million people, if the sooner they get it, the rest of the population that needs it will get it, that wants it will get it. And, and I think that's a very important criteria to take back this one point to say that when you're called, like when um, Harshu did say it'll be like an election procedure. So a little bit pretty much like that, your number will come up, they'll call you, you book an appointment. You can't just go there to, to a polling booth and say, hey, I'm in this, I need a vaccine. They, it will be organized, you go there, there'll be an officer, uh, there'll be a protection agent, there'll be an officer, there'll be an administrator, and all this will take place. So this is by and large, the. So, so I asked them, what is the role of the private sector in this? Because you need a large number. The sooner we can get those 300 million vaccinated, the, 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 then the others will, will, can, can get. So at that point, they said, 
please offer your services. So whoever in this group of medical administrators or anyone that's there, this is the time for us to approach state governments, work with them, set up camps, go out there and, and see what we can do to augment. And then I asked, "Will what's the price? I said, you know, Apollo is, is going to get it. Uh, why would you just give it to us free? We can give it from our CSR fund. And they said, very interesting. But right now we have to think about 300 million. And, and, and I think that the government is finalizing on that. But by and large, I think most of it is going to be free. The first wave is going to be free. So as administrators, uh, we have been, we've taken a decision also that if the government is giving this free, it would be our call that if they can provide us with the materials that we require, we should do it free also and just serve in that first wave. So this is, I think, what the whole country will come together to make sure. Now, the second wave, and, and I do believe that the second wave will probably be when, when the demand and supply is going to start evening out, when you're going to get five or six candidates out there. And at that point, the private sector will be allowed to purchase. And they will be allowed to purchase. The pricing I've heard is anywhere between $10 to $20 a dose. And this is, again, uh, one year from now, the price is going to be very different, much lower when, when there are 100 candidates out there. But having said that, during that period, more and more people can do it. Our responsibility is to make sure we give the vaccine safe and there's no price gouging. And this is another responsibility of, 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 of even the private sector that comes in, that we don't make money off this. And we make sure that, again, it's in an organized way. I would think by the time the second wave is over, my hope is that by Diwali, uh, we would have achieved herd immunity. And, um, and the Festival of Lights will really be a Festival of Lights. And I'm going to hand over to Puanch. Thank you. And I'm available for any questions. Uh, thank you. Um, before, before Puanj comes in, uh, Harshia, this is thank you so much. That was very clear. Couldn't be, <clears throat> couldn't have expected less from you. Uh, but I think you have set the context very well, and I, I will we, be eager to hear what Puanj has in much more. But this was really fabulous. And actually, <clears throat> part of this, Dr. Paul mentioned uh, a couple of days ago when I heard him at the Fiki AGM. Uh, sure. He didn't go into this much detail, but he did talk about the protocol and 300 million people, the priority and healthcare workers, people above 50, and also people below 50 with comorbidities. And if I remember, there was 260 million broken up from those 260 plus 30 and 10 and something like that. But once great to um, looking forward to hearing from you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Harsh. Uh, first off, I just wanted to say this is an incredible opportunity for me, and I'm super excited to be here speaking to all of you. Hopefully, I'm able to add some value to this discussion and uh, bring in some knowledge that is useful to everyone. Uh, so that being said, uh, let me just share a quick document that we have put together. So just want to make sure that everyone can see the screen. <clears throat> Perfect. So uh, before I get started, I just wanted to say and reiterate what Ms. Shobna had said a little while ago uh, in terms of how the government has set out guidelines of how doses will be administered, priority groups first, the government's role in it, as well as the private sector's role in it. And for the most part, I must say that uh, from the private sector's perspective, we are now incredibly happy and grateful to have that uh, those guidelines out there, especially because they're so incredibly detailed. Now, the reason why we feel it's so important is because just like everyone has been saying before this, uh, the first wave of vaccines that we get into the country uh, are going to be incredibly scarce and hard to come by. For this very reason, especially with uh, population size as large as ours, it's incredibly imperative to have some level of protection on it. And uh, the government prioritizing certain groups, creating the COVID app for registration, uh, creating all of these backdrops to make sure only the right people get access to these uh, honestly life-saving vaccines at this point uh, was honestly amazing and fantastic initiative. And now I think that puts so much more pressure on the private sector that when this opens up to them, that they're actually able to match the same level of performance and uh, 
adherence to the small minor details that the government has given when they wrote out their uh, initial guidelines, and also keep up with uh, the pace that the private sector manufacturers have been putting up in delivering this vaccine in honestly record time. Now, that being said, I'm going to split this document. I'm going to keep it really quick and short, but I'm going to split this document into three different parts. One being the evolving vaccine landscape, which I'm sure everyone here is really interested in hearing about in terms of what vaccines we might have access to and when. Then specifically, what the distinctive capabilities we have at uh, Apollo hospitals, as well as how that might translate to the private sector's capabilities in general, as well as finally, the importance of uh, a administration and to that extent the importance of technology in this whole uh, new administration run so getting into it now and i believe people had mentioned earlier uh, since the start of covid there's been about 350 different vaccines worldwide that people have started working on each of them are at different stages of approval or testing uh, because we were looking at the highest quality of product as, as well as the product that would be most readily available to us at uh, the shortest time, we shortlisted this to about eight vaccines. Now, uh, a couple of these, I'm sure all of you have heard Moderna and Pfizer who've been gaining international recognition over the past couple of weeks or month, I should say, with uh, their incredibly high efficacy rate, as well as a couple of local vaccines where we have uh, AstraZeneca tying up with Serum Institute India could be one of their largest manufacturers and Serum Institute is the largest vaccine manufacturer in the world, as well as a completely uh, homegrown and developed vaccine coming from Bharat Biotech. Uh, now, the reason why we wanted to get into the specifics of each of these products is because one, some of these technologies are age old and have been in existence for quite some time now since the start of vaccines and uh, test technology for that matter as well as the other, uh, some of the other vaccines uh, that we've been shortlisting and we've been looking at are brand new technologies where we've had no idea whether they'll work or not, but based on current results, we're seeing that they have the highest levels of efficacy when it comes to Moderna and Pfizer, which are uh, the mRNA vaccines. Now, given that all of these vaccines have an incredibly high efficacy rate and a lot of people might want to get their hands on them, something that's been on a lot of people's mind and Mr. Harshivan mentioned that at the start of this conversation, is that a lot of these vaccines have uh, incredibly complicated transportation and logistical norms in terms of storage and transportation temperatures, uh, being at these negative 70 degrees for the Pfizer vaccine or uh, negative 20 for the Moderna vaccine. Now, where we believe that the government of India, again, has had tremendous foresight and have thought about this and made incredibly well-educated bets is the fact that they backed the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, which is tied up with Serum Institute, as well as the Bharat Biotech vaccine. Now, the main reason for that is uh, while most, of, well, all of these mRNA vaccines with the incredibly high advocacy are requiring these deep freeze storage, Bharat Biotech and AstraZeneca vaccines that can be transported at your regular two to eight degrees, which is common for all cold chain uh, pharmaceuticals across the board meaning we have existing capabilities here in India to be able to push these uh, particular vaccines in very large scales with a very minor increase in our current infrastructure. If, on the other hand, we were needing to deal with these deep freeze vaccines when it come, came to Moderna or Pfizer, for the most part, we would need to completely overhaul our base infrastructure. And uh, when I'm talking about this, I don't just mean polo hospitals. Uh, I mean any distributor or uh, hospital administrator in general, almost across the board, just because one, we did have deep freeze vaccines that needed negative 20 degrees, but those were highly specialized and uh, few in number. But we absolutely never have dealt with something that went down as low as negative 70 before. So the fact that the government of India had the foresight to go and back vaccines that were, one, had had good standing in terms of potential efficacy considering both viral vectors and inactivated vaccines which is what Bharat biotech and uh, astrazeneca are have been around for decades but the fact also that they're applicable to our own situation here in india in terms of transportation i think was fantastic now this being said uh, i don't want to dissuade anyone thinking that we at india don't have the capability of moving pfizer's vaccine or moderna's vaccine if they ever come to us uh, because honestly we do especially because a lot of these whole chain products have a certain concept called residual stability, meaning they can be brought down from that deep freeze temperature to a room temperature where they will be administered and they can be held at that point for anywhere between five to 30 days. The great thing about that is within India, 
both the government and the private sector have built uh, sustainable and incredibly effective logistical lanes, which make it well within anyone's scope to be able to transport and administer any of these vaccines within those 30 days. So just in case anybody was hoping to get that Pfizer vaccine, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't or wouldn't come to India eventually. Now, moving into our distinctive capabilities as the Apollo Group, and then I'm going to pivot on this of how this will extrapolate to the whole private sector. Now, as we said, and as Ms. Shobna mentioned earlier, in the start, the government might really want to have control over this activity for a number of very legitimate reasons, most of all being controlling a scarce supply of products and making sure that they get to the right people. But the moment the, there is a over or surplus supply of any vaccine candidate or multiple vaccine candidates in the market, I think it's imperative for the private sector to jump right in on that opportunity, mainly because at the scale we're looking at to be able to get to 70% uh, inoculations across our population, hit that herd immunity mark, we're going to need to be doing a significant number of vaccines. And another thing which uh, I think a lot of people have pointed out, but uh, still seems to get passed by sometimes is the fact that all vaccines, uh, most vaccines, I would say 95% of them so far are two dose vaccines, meaning people need to be injected twice. And the most important thing about this is immunity is not long lasting in the sense that this is not a one and done shot. You are probably going to need this shot once every year as a booster, the same way you get it for the flu vaccine. Now, considering that, I don't think it is too viable for the government to be setting up uh, permanent infrastructure and permanent processes in play to be giving people repeat shots for the same COVID vaccine over the next two or three years, just because uh, it's going to be hard to offset those infrastructure costs, considering the government is trying to give it to us at an incredibly subsidized rate for all the best reasons. But uh, because of the complexity and the length and duration of this total endeavor, I think it is imperative that at some point the private sector gets into this game. And for that, uh, uh, companies like Apollo have already started working on this. And I'm sure that a lot of other private sectors have also. So just to paint you kind of an idea of how it's going to look, uh, the way we've been looking at it through all of our partners is more of an end-to-end -end, uh, solution from delivery from the manufacturer side all the way to administration. Now, Apollo has access to over 64 warehouses in India that have been doing traditional pharma retail to them in terms of providing them their medicines either to the pharmacies or to the final hospitals. Uh, our distribution partner has been extensively experienced with cold chain, with insulins and uh, other vaccines. So we know and we've tried and tested that this is possible. Now, in terms of Apollo's administration capability, they have over 6,000 sites across India, including 74 hospitals, a few thousand, a thousand clinics, and uh, around 4,000 pharmacies that we're repurposing to be able to solve uh, this lack of administration sites, especially in rural areas, considering Apollo Pharmacy has incredible density across the board. Now, that being said, for any bit of capability that Apollo has, we are sure that the rest of the private players in the market would be able to easily double that overall number giving us extensive overall reach. Now, when we just talk about how this is going to look, what we've done is looked at where we have our own facilities and what percentage of the population we reach. And what we've been able to see is through our own facilities, we'd be able to get to over 850 cities pan India in over 48 hours. Reason why that 48 hour period is so important is because we're transporting cold chain equipment and the amount of time you spend in your vehicles is critical to the efficacy of the vaccine and the total cost you're putting down into it. Now, what we've been able to see is over these 850 cities that we can reach, just Apollo alone has access to about 75 crores worth of India's population, translating to about 60%. Now, just that is 5% away from that herd immunity mark. So being able to tie this on with Again, incredibly extensive private sector capability considering India is one of the countries in the world with the most private sector healthcare facilities. Just the private sector would definitely be able to hit any sort of herd immunity marker that we would need in the country and reach a very, very vast zone. Now, just mapping Apollo facilities within this area, you'll see that we, uh, as everyone knows, are incredibly strong in the South, but have a totally pan-India presence. But when you map over and see what the government capability is within the same region, you have a truly uh, awe-inspiring number 
where if Apollo has 6,000 facilities over these uh, 17 different states and regions, the government has over 100,000 different facilities. Meaning that uh, right now, at least when this vaccine administration starts, I honestly think that nobody should have uh, any form of worry in terms of getting access to this vaccine, just because we have a truly tremendous amount of resources at our uh, hand, both in terms of the government and in terms of the private sector. Now, moving on to this, getting into the specifics of how Apollo hospitals will try and supplement this and how any private hospital will try and supplement this. We broke our administration sites down into different facilities. And uh, like I said, based on just our hospitals, clinics and our traditional healthcare facilities, we'd be able to inoculate anywhere between uh, 250 million, I mean, 250,000, to 650,000 people just at our traditional sites. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of upskilling our pharmacists and reconverting our pharmacies and diagnostic facilities to be able to administer vaccines and have the expertise for the employees to be able to administer vaccines. And through all of our resources, uh, based on obviously availability of supply, we'll be able to administer anywhere between 500,000 to a million vaccines per day across all of our facilities span India. Now, again, Apollo is just one small cog in this whole healthcare system across India. And our thought here is if Apollo is able to provide this 500,000 vaccine inoculations per day at an average level, the government is probably going to be several fold higher than that. And when complemented with other private players, we're looking at a truly staggering number. And that just shows you uh, for everything that people might say about uh, our level of preparedness, India really is ready to hit the ground running when it comes to administration. So now the most important thing here, and a lot of people have been talking about it, is the number of administrators we have access to. Uh, like I just mentioned, Apollo might have the number of administrators available to be able to do 500,000 to a million doses. But considering we're going to need them in remote locations, as well as the fact that uh, COVID is still going strong in India, we're in flu season right now. So hospitals are at a good amount of utilization and we might not have access uh, to too many free administrators both the private sector and the government as well as release guidelines on upskilling current employees within the healthcare field to be able to be acquainted with administration of vaccines, as well as retaining some people within this existing healthcare environment who haven't maybe had the experience of uh, inoculations in the past. So what I, the main picture that I'm trying to paint over here is both the private sector and the government has been working on this, looking at almost every single angle and aspect of how administration would work and have honestly covered most of their bases. Now, moving on to the last and most important aspect of what I wanted to talk to everybody here about is the integration of tech into this. Now, uh, the reason why I believe that it's incredibly imperative to have some level of uh, tech database, at least in terms of our administrations, is one, to make sure, and this is, I believe, exactly what the government is doing, and they're doing a fantastic job of it, tracking and making sure that vials and doses of these incredibly scarce vaccines get to the people who actually need it the most. And that's exactly what they have stated out with their COVID app in terms of registering for a product, being part, just like how Ms. Shobna said, uh, being part of a comorbidity group or a high priority group, and that be the only way that they can get access to it. Now, going beyond that, why I feel that it's incredibly important is just as Mr. Harsh pointed out in the start, normally a vaccine would only be uh, produced in a period of maybe five to 10 years, mainly because the stage three trials or even the stage two trials went on for multiple years, considering they tried to get in as big a control group as possible and monitor them for as long a period of, as long a period of time as possible. Now, considering uh, a lot of these vaccines have been pushed through the process incredibly fast, uh, we haven't been able to do a lot of the long-term studies. Not to say that the vaccines uh, have any form of efficacy issues, just because the amount of research and the amount of intellect that's been put behind them is immense and is nothing like ever before. But that doesn't change away from the fact that it is imperative that we track this long-term data. So people like Apollo or uh, other healthcare platforms in the private sector have the capability of taking down usage data in the form of people who are getting uh, this vaccine administered, as well as keeping them within their own databases and tracking them long-term and feeding that information one back to the government so that they know what percentage of the population has been inoculated and two to the manufacturers where they can actually judge the true efficacy of their product over a long period of time. 
and that way i feel companies like apollo have an integration all the way from the start from their distribution arm all the way to their administration arm have a tremendous role and uh, opportunity over here to be able to supplement growth for uh, these manufacturers as well as improve the efficacy of the government's uh, vaccination program so i hope i haven't uh, gone on too long but uh, this was kind of a snapshot of what we've been looking at as well as uh, where we see the private sector playing into this and how we see ourselves integrating with the government with that i'm going to stop and uh, open this up to any questions um <clears throat> thank you uh, so much for that uh, wonderful presentation and uh, greatly appreciate it and uh, very very clear <clears throat> very clear and uh, uh, also if i if i may say um, very encouraging as well uh, in terms of where we are in terms of government preparedness and and of course the incredible capability that apollo has to uh, to deliver this and that that as you said that gives them a good idea about what private sector can do to to also to to pitch in and really uh, fantastic we have a lot of questions uh, and people wanting to know things uh, although um, shobhana and you and even prita you have clarified some things uh, in your in your uh, remarks um, so i i will um, sort of um read out some of the questions that have been put on the chat and i'll try and summarize some of them so uh we have some questions around uh, you know now uh, there's dr sanjay bahel who's asking uh, about um, how can education institutions uh also add value if any or medical research institutions also uh, do we have although once you talked about it at the end uh there are questions that people have about possible side effects and if i understood you correctly you said that many of these vaccines are actually have been around for other things uh, for a while and then uh, they have been repurposed in some way some of them so do we have uh, what kind of side effects and um, and things like that uh, i i'll reel off a couple of questions and then you know maybe you can put them together uh people are asking about the appropriateness of these vaccines for for india you covered it in terms of perhaps the uh the transportation and temperature but other other medical aspects for our uh, is what i would like to extend it to in, in our genes or whatever uh kind of thing and um, so uh what about getting this really deep into the rural areas as well and um you know we we talked you you talked about the distribution etc etc so i i'd like to just leave it here uh for the moment and then we'll have some of our past presidents also come in and ask questions thanks uh, uh can i come in uh, pita and punch and take a shot and let you any, any of you three can do this <laughs> okay so so you know coming in we'll start with the rural i kind of sent it on the chat i think that uh, this is the place where medical colleges so it's you you had asked about it earlier i think that medical colleges will play a huge role because not only do they have uh, students in the final year and we who can become vaccinators but also they have the uh, infrastructure available many of them are in uh, are in the districts so that would help move this out but uh, you know the psus yesterday we met with the chairman of uh, nmdc for instance so they've allocated 15 crores to go into the to go into the tribal areas so they came, reached out and said can you help us so i think that while the uh, while there will be funds available a lot of private sector will be called to help in this effort so i think that's that's the answer will it get done immediately i i would think that in terms of the priority it's bet you can get herd immunity in cities and towns and just move down because somehow rural india has really managed covid much better than uh, than 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 some of urban so you know hats off to them that uh, that that we can move in there in a phased manner and uh, the government has committed to buying 600 uh, uh, 600 million doses so that's a two dose vaccine that's 300 million so this is something that they've already done 
and they have the capability to be able to uh, to get it in and the trucks to take it into different states uh, in in our federated uh, in our federated model the state governments will be tasked along with the psus to put this together and so any of the private uh, the hospitals the uh, and and corporates who would like to participate in this i suggest that you now work through ima through fiki through cii go out and meet the state governments and see how we can help in the phase 1 in the phase 2 it will become way more professional and then you ask what is a vaccine to take so i'm going to speak from a very personal point of view of what i would give my dad and mom and i would take myself and and we went through a lot of that that should be wait should be make sure that all this and i would think that the first vaccine that we can get that you're eligible for as long as you're eligible for it has enough uh, ha- is not only safe one thing is sure and and you will find that the government has not hurried it in any single way they've not cut any corners in any of these vaccines because uh, safety is more than efficacy so you will find that it might not be the 90% of a pfizer but definitely even at 70% the chances of mortality and and getting and getting covid in 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 a in a you know highly morbid way reduces so the first dose i wouldn't be so picky anything that is on the table take it and and just remember that this is not your final that maybe one year from now when you need it when you need the booster shots you can definitely be more designer and you'll have more uh, information available i'm going to stop there and and there are plenty of anti vaxxers i respect that those that don't want to take the vaccine and that are going to be careful and say that i'm fine let herd immunity come that's definitely a thought in the world if you look at singapore and some of these countries that are actually paying people to take a vaccine what but we study in apollo sorry when we we actually did a survey and surprisingly i gave this to the economist and and they said among all the countries indians have the highest propensity to take the vaccine ah that's very interesting yeah 90% of indians in our we did 50000 people and now and 92% of them said that they would take the vaccine 33% of them said they would wait 3 months hmm we want to talk about how uh, you know people are getting trained and maybe the district hospital how that's going to gear up to actually deliver god sure. uh, uh, i'd love to talk on that in fact just a quick another add on to one of the questions asked uh, which was the role of uh, these colleges and other education platforms uh, like ms shobhna just mentioned one is definitely as a site of administration 100% people are definitely looking at that because you need as many of these as possible and for the most part anyone above a second or third year medical student has already had some experience with uh, intramuscular injections uh, so definitely that is a very good thought process another thing there though is like we mentioned the amount of administrators that we have right now in india is a serious problem especially because the only people legally allowed to make an administration is a registered doctor or nurse to become a registered doctor or nurse isn't an easy process for that i think at some point of time uh, the government might look into this or otherwise even private sector should put forward some sort of a proposal to maybe upskill existing uh, people within the medical professional whether it's a phlebotomist a lab technician or someone with a basic level of medical understanding to be able to now have the necessary skill set to make an administration and i think that's uh, where education platforms could really shine in this because across the board across the world uh, we're seeing that the number of administrators is a real issue uh, now pivoting away from that to get into the exact specifics of how we'd set up one of our facilities uh, we've been doing multiple costing activities and uh, program pops and modeling in terms of how we'd be stocking one of these facilities now based on the information that the government released on saturday i mean friday on how their own facilities would be set up we might need to make a few adjustments but for the most part it's the same where uh, each facility would need to have set personnel in terms of uh, monitoring staff registration staff as well as that particular administrator 
Now, behind all of this, uh, there's a whole waterfall of different items and logistical aspects that go into it. Uh, all the way from the storage of these vaccines at these particular sites, considering uh, even if it's not deep freeze, it's still cold storage for which you will need to have dedicated facilities, um, as well as a set amount of staff working on this activity at any point of time. Now, along with that, considering, again, it's a communicable disease being COVID, you're going to need PPE, which I'm sure all of you have been thinking about uh, since anything related to COVID is being discussed. And most importantly around this is the amount of medical consumables that will go into actual administration. So while everyone in the facility will be needing to wear some level of PPE, the actual administrator is going to have uh, a lot more of it and it's going to be switched out a lot more uh, often. So based on that, we have estimated anywhere between needing, if we are going to be doing around a million inoculations a day with a million, with 10,000 inoculators, those 10,000 inoculators would probably need 40,000 sets of gloves, uh, 40,000 sets of masks, I'm sorry, and 80,000 sets of gloves going on behind them. Now, the way we've been looking at it in terms of how uh, the costing might set up or the amount of administrations might set up, based on the different facilities we're using, they'll be able to handle different capacity. So a larger scale facility like a hospital or one of the hospitals that we've been looking to set up for this activity yeah. might be able to push out about 7,000 administrations per day, uh, given the fact that an administrator would be able to do about 90 administrations during his eight-hour shift, considering a well-trained professional, at least within our setting, we've been able to say that they'd be able to administer a shot within five minutes. Now, the waterfall of consumables behind this is immense, considering for every one of those 94 patients, that administrator is going to need to switch out his gloves every single time. He's going to need a new syringe every single time. Uh, and the flow of consumables that go into that just add up in terms of your PPE gowns and uh, your total kits. So the way we've split this out is uh, the hope that we'll have between seven to 8,000 administrations per hospital, about 400 to 500 administrations per clinic. And uh, if we're able to get our ambulatory service facilities and pharmacies geared up for this activity, which is again, uh, how we are hoping to be able to reach these far out and brutal communities, uh, we'd be at about f uh, 50 inoculations per day at each pharmacy. And I don't want to get carried away and give you guys an actual number in terms of how much it might cost us, but a rough ballpark estimate would be around uh, the 200 rupee mark per administration. Uh, and like Ms. Shobna said earlier, the kind of vaccine range we've been getting, at least in terms of third-party information that's out there and available to the public, uh, is a vaccine being anywhere between 10 to $20, meaning around 730 rupees all the way up to 1500 rupees. Uh, hopefully, the vaccines that we've tied up with India will be within that 700 range, meaning a total cost of about 900 rupees for vaccine administration. For the most part, I think that's an incredibly competitive price because uh, it's cheaper than a lot of the testing out there. Now, I know that a lot of states have set in a new rule of uh, maybe 700 rupees based on where you're staying, uh, but compared and, and to also, traditional and vaccines also out there. A lot will be given free. Exactly. Uh, so when the government comes in, this is a free activity. I'm talking about later on private sector scope when uh, they start doing administrations with uh, surplus of vaccines in the market. So uh, considering all of that, I think it is an incredibly competitive price. And over time, with the scale that we're able to bring and operational efficiencies that we'll gain over time, we're hoping that we'll be able to bring that cost as low as possible. But just to give you an example, right now, an average vaccine might cost anywhere between, outside of COVID, might cost anywhere between 2,500 to 5,000 rupees. So we're at an incredibly competitive price range with this COVID vaccine. Well, that's, uh, that's terrific. And uh, I mean, I, I think our, our minds are buzzing with, uh, with, with thoughts around the information that you've given us. Uh, can I request, Mr. Sudhir Jalan is there, past president. Uh, can I request you to... Thank you, Harsh. First of all, I feel proud to be a part of the Apollo family. Uh, Rita and Shobna, an excellent presentation, though we have heard hundreds of them. This was something which came closest to our heart. Two simple questions. We are expecting 600 million doses, but when does the first commercial doses start? 
Do you expect it in February? When I say commercial, say a million doses, I'm not talking of a hundred or a thousand. Secondly, is there any substantial difference between the one vaccine and the other? And say, if I were to get a choice, should I wait another 20 days to take a Pfizer or a Moderna rather than a biotech? Thank you. Uh, so Sudhirji, uh, interesting questions. Uh, one is that you're not going to get the Pfizer and the Moderna in 20 days or two months. It's probably going to be close to the end of the year, uh, unless you know you have access abroad. Because uh, even when we spoke to them directly and through the government, they said that they're, that they're maxed out in terms of their production. So they have to create more facilities. I would think six months, but uh, they would probably do go through the DGCI process to make sure the trials are in place because this is a market that they'll want to be in. And I'm sure that they will bring the vaccine, but uh, you, it's a six month wait. wait. And, and like I said, uh, the first... Uh, the first wave of giving this 300 million, the government is not going to allow us to procure while the pressure is on. So they don't want confusion in the market. They don't want a situation where there could be misuse or black marketing or price gouging or anything like that. So I think that for the first few months, we have to be patient and, and wait our turn. So, so that's the first wave. And I think that's where the time of great discipline is going to come. Uh, it's a test of the country's character. Thank you. Okay. But, but if I may, I mean, I know I'm conscious that it's already all seven. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I see Mr. Rajiv called them. Rajiv, you have a, a question? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh... Ash, thanks. And it's uh, firstly great to see uh, uh, two uh, past presidents who I've had the pleasure of working with, <laughs> one, one in CII and, and the other in IMA itself. So it's great to have both of you. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm very, very impressed, Shobna, with your, with your son. He's, he's done a great presentation. So congratulations to you. I think the family is keeping the tradition up of having sort of great people. Uh, my question, though, is uh, actually uh, pertaining to how long would it take to train uh, uh, a person uh, who is, say, young and reasonably uh, skilled and responsible to give an uh, uh, intramuscular vaccine? Uh, that is the first part. And then, B, won't it be or should be possible, I think, if uh, if uh, either CII, FIKI, or IMA, or all of them together, uh, lobby the government to get a standard uh, and uh, a certain certifications worked out for people to increase the availability of such people so that all uh, pharmacies can be used uh, to sort of uh, vaccinate uh, population. So, what would your your advice be? This question is open to any three of you, actually. So I think I can speak really quickly on the first part, on the length of the training. So, before we started this activity, uh, like I said, the only real people who are authorized to make a vaccination or any injection in India is a registered nurse or a registered doctor. Now, for to turn out a registered nurse or a registered doctor is a multiple year uh, education program where you go to medical school. However, we were hoping that we could maybe create an upskill program that would be able to give you these necessary skill sets and then maybe get government accreditation. Now, the way we built this is based on existing training platform uh, in terms of something we have right now called a GDA, which is basically a nurse's assistant, where we upskill people to be able to this basic level of uh, knowledge. We've created a similar structure using the best minds at Apollo, our best doctors, as well as our existing medical platform, I mean, educational platforms, to create a syllabus that's around two weeks long, uh, that has both online and physical training uh, courses. 
that actually give you any, everything you need in terms of vaccine administration and post-vaccine assessment, just because uh, there's large uh, risk of an reaction. It's not a large risk, but there is a risk of allergic reactions or adverse effects. So we've created a broad overall view of how this would work, what the training modules will be, uh, the, what the physical test might be to actually test competency. And so far, we have put it forward to a few educational bodies like the NSDC and HSCA. Uh, we're also hoping to approach the healthcare ministry and offer them this as a resource to be able to standardize and use across the person said. But I believe someone else on this, uh, on this panel might be able to answer your sec the second half of your question better. But I definitely think it is a fantastic idea. And if we can get traction on that, it will be phenomenal. Um, I think just then, you know, uh, a bit of the same answer is that we need to get some kind of a certification in place because we don't have enough healthcare workers in the country. And uh, to be able to train them to, to administer this and also to be watchful and mindful of, you know, like immediate side and the registry. So there is a lot of work that is being put into place. And I think it'd be great if CIR and IMA, because, you know, the skill sector uh, development, they have to agree to it. And then we need to be able to give that kind of certification. So please I don't leave Fiki out. Please don't leave Fiki out. Huh? Sorry, you said CIR and IMA. I'm told I'm told that uh, the that uh, CII was specially invited to the first uh, uh, council meeting of, yes. of Fiki yeah? so that was fantastic well yeah, done. Yeah, I don't know why I Ima was needed. left out but you know <laughs> Ima is not lobbying <laughs> yeah, well, they were, yeah. you know, I mean, I know, but they can lobby on this particular aspect because it's in the national yeah. interest. No, and and can... training piece, it's a training piece, so we need to get that certification, and it's a great idea we should think uh -huh. about. Yeah, but particularly if it's going to take two weeks, according to, you know, your, what That's your son was just mentioning, uh -huh. uh, it'd be fantastic, you know, Shobna, I mean... President, we'll let, let us give it to you, Hutch. We, we give you the document that uh, that, that, that you've sent in to the uh, uh, to, to to the HR ministry. Let us send it to the to the skills development uh, corporation. We'll send you the document, and if you can, you know, modify, help make this. Uh, one last thing, just before we go, I think we spent enough time on technology. Interactions with Nandan Nilkani and everybody, but the government just went out there and because of their digital health mission, they had work. So the underpinning of this entire vaccination that is going to allow them for it, for it to really uh, bear fruit is the fact that they have the COVID. The platform is ready. And, and let me tell you to just, it'll be linked to your other. So wherever you go in the world, you can show that you have this vaccine which will be an accepted document. So this is very important that there's an IT backbone that, uh, that the government has and anyone in the private sector will have to be able to, uh, to, to get the API and integrate it uh, so as part of the health stack. So I just want to leave you with that point. Right, thanks Shobna. Um, no, I, I think the last point you made is, is very significant and I think <clears throat> that uh, you, in your opening remarks, or Puanch also talked about, in fact, Puanch made a special, special mention about the technology part. And actually, the, the success of this is also going to be determined through technology because the whole tracking, while physically you can do the infrastructure. Now, for example, I, I you know, uh, if I can personalize this and I don't mind it, I contracted COVID, okay? And I had the government of Delhi because I had a test, obviously. Uh, I had the government of Delhi uh, person calling from Bangalore, of course, call center, that doesn't matter, every day to check, uh, you know, uh, whether I'm okay, whether I have a doctor, whether I'm, I, I'm having temperature, uh -huh. I, whether I'm okay. And I, you know, and in fact, they landed up at my house and very polite, not intrusive. 
I said, I have my own, uh, you know, a GP and he's attending to me and I'm taking this kind of medication. They said, sir, we just wanted to check. So this is something which has actually happened and I, I can, you know, testify to this. And where did they get this from? Simply from uh, my COVID, uh, you know, test report, which would have my details, right? And nothing else. So it, they are tracking. And then later on, I am getting SMSs to say, would you be interested in being a plasma donor? So technology, Shobhna, to your point, is actually being used. And this is there. I also know, for example, that the International Chamber of Commerce Paris, on whose board I sit, ICC Paris, they have been trying to promote something called an AOK pass, wherein you have global travelers, right? And some countries are taking that as a pilot to say that if you have certain health parameters that are sort of certified, you can gain entry into, into those countries without having certain other um, procedures or, uh, or, or those kinds of things. So technology is something which is going to be, is going to be really key. Uh, if, I mean, you know, we could go on and on uh, with this and because this is something which has evoked a lot of interest. There are many more questions that people have asked and um, I, I'm sorry, I will not be able to take on, but I think we've got a huge wealth of information today from this, uh, from this dialogue, if I may say, or, or from this presentation. Uh, I just want, if I can put, put out a couple of takeaways that I understood, or I, I hope I've understood, is um, you are saying that in terms of timing, hopefully all things going well, uh, we should in, in calendar year 2021, towards the later part of calendar year 2021, you mentioned Diwali, uh, we should be in a position where a large part of our population might have been vaccinated and uh, at least acquired herd immunity levels for opening up much more uh, freer uh, movement in, in, the, in the economy and society. The first thing you are saying, which is also very interesting is in the first wave, are you saying that as, as much as uh, in the first quarter of 21, calendar year 21, we will start having maybe January, February uh, vaccination programs already starting with the, uh, with the hierarchy that I said. And the second wave will probably come in H2 of the year where you will have a greater number of people. And uh, so if, if I've understood those facts, correct, Sobhna, that- uh, Absolutely, Absolutely Harsh. And, and, and uh, one more thing, just because you've had COVID, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't take the vaccine. No, I know, I know that because the life is- yeah. if, if No, a lot of people, think a lot of people think that they have the antibody so yeah no you're right you're right and uh, but but glad that you answered these questions because you know we were having if i can personalize it again we were having and this is a dialogue i'm sure which happens in every participants uh, who's on the call in their families so you ask your older parents and they say should we take it should we not take it uh, will it have side effects at our age and i think you've touched on many of these aspects now nobody knows for sure so let's not get carried away. But you are giving us uh, from, from the medical side a, a great deal of confidence to say it seems to be fairly uh, safe. I think that's a very important message. And if I can add on one more thing, it's going to be an, an important job for all of us from our associations as responsible people, as well as along with the government to see how do we spread the, the right information across the country. Because a lot of questions are coming from uh, half-baked information or misinformation that is, that is there. And therefore, if we are able to really spread this, um, the, the, the kinds of information that you have talked about today, I think that is also very important. And that, uh, Mr. Call, will be a topic which you know our chamber should also get involved in dissemination. And I'm, of course, uh, this kind of uh, this kind of thing. The other significant takeaway that you talked about is that the government is largely going to run this free, which is quite interesting. And it's only later on that they will be paid through private sector. And, and uh, very... Harsh, we must thank uh, the international associations of Gavi and all of their COVAX yes. that came together 
that really funded a lot of the research, the innovation, and also these plants to come up. Because many of them have been made those investments of 100 million, 200 million dollars. So that, that's why the vaccine is also so cheap. So we shouldn't go away without acknowledging the fact that this has been a global effort. Absolutely, absolutely. So these are some of the things, I mean, there are many things, but these, these are some of the things which I thought were really great. And I would like to once again, thank uh, all, uh, Preeta, Shobhana, uh, all of you uh, immensely and Puansh, um, particularly you for giving us all the confidence. Uh, that is wonderful. Also, I, I am glad on a personal note to how now having been introduced to, uh, you know, a third generation member of your family. Your grandfather, Dr. Reddy, has of course been a very old family friend and, and actually more than that, he's been the father of medicines in, in many ways in, in the country with, with this. So really glad that we had this opportunity. I know there are other people who still wanted to ask questions, but um, I'm afraid we won't have time for that. And um, But this is not the last, I suppose, that we are going to be talking about this. But um, great, thank you very much for a great, great session. And thanks for everybody to participate. Uh, we've had more than a thousand people uh, directly, indirectly on this show. Uh, so um, can you imagine the kind of curiosity this has? Wonderful, thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you all. Thanks, Rika. Thank you. We'll have the next leader speak session on the uh, 18th of uh, December at 12.30 with Mr. Shekhar Gupta. So do log on, all of you, if you can spare the time. Thank you and have a good evening.